Welcome uh, to the second debate hosted by the SOHO Forum. Uh, welcome both to those who attended our first debate and to all newcomers. I'm uh, Gene Epstein, economics and book editor of Barron's Financial Weekly, and I'm uh, the director and host of the SOHO Forum. And uh, my marketing director, Naomi, is about ready uh, to get you to vote, to ruminate, at least, on the resolution that we'll be debating today. And do you want me to read the resolution, Naomi? Uh, that's fine, just typing in now. Okay, the resolution, as some of you may already know, is robots will eventually dominate the world and eliminate human abilities to earn wages. I'll read it again. Robots will eventually dominate the world and eliminate human abilities to earn wages. The Soul Forum has a twofold mission. Uh, first, to present sizzling debates between brilliant people on issues that interest freedom loving folks. And since there is no test administered to the attendees, power hungry folks are also free to attend. <laughs> uh, second, uh, our mission, just as important, of, is that the SOA Forum is meant to be a place where people can socialize and get to know each other. That's the purpose of the wine and cheese reception, which uh, has already started and will commence full blast at around 8.15 and last until 9.30 this evening. So you are cordially invited to stick around to talk with the speakers and could get to know everyone, including me. Uh, in an age of soundbite and speed talking, the Soho Forum is also, is also a place where people can be given the chance to talk in paragraphs. That's why all the debates will involve one person against one person, rather than the two against two format that is often followed. Of course, that places a special burden on each side of the debate to be knowledgeable and insightful, and I believe our two debaters tonight more than fulfill that requirement. For me, the Soho Forum is a labor of love, in part because it's run by a group of loving volunteers that include my wife, Hisaka Kubayashi, who prepared the food for this evening, one of my daughters, thank you, uh, one, of, one of my dear daughters, Naomi Brockwell, uh, the marketing director who's responsible for reaching so many of you about the Soho Forum, and especially, as well, to the Smith Family Foundation for providing us with the funding, and to Julie Smith, who is here tonight and who has patiently helped administer our somewhat messy affairs. Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, the affirmative is Robin Hansen, uh, and uh, he deserves to be introduced first. Uh, he is the author of The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life When Robots Rule the Earth, copies of which he'll be selling for just $20 a copy this evening, just $20 in cash. Robin will sign it for you. I've read it myself. It's an amusing book at the very least. <laughs> and it's a stimulating book uh, at the very most. And maybe you'll even find it convincing. Uh, the Age of M by Robin Hansen. Uh, speaking for the negative will be Brian Kaplan. Uh, you can read about them both at greater length on, on our website, uh, the, uh, the soaforum.org. The only thing I will say about them is that they are both economics professors at George Mason University, so they do uh, know each other fairly well. They will still be friends even after this debate, apparently. We're gonna follow a rather uh, odd uh, uh, pattern that both, both sides have agreed to. Uh, the, uh, Robin will speak the, for the affirmative for five minutes, uh, then uh, Brian will speak for the negative for five minutes, and then for 30 minutes, instead of parceling out the time, they will have a free-for-all discussion, debate, dialogue, uh, and uh, I might interrupt if one of them is hawking the dialogue, but otherwise I'll just let them have at each other, and then uh, we'll have 30 minutes of Q&A from the audience. Uh, you'll be lining up in front of that mic, and there will be chairs for those who are a little bit tired of standing. And then we'll have five minutes of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of a summary from, uh, from Robin and five minutes of summary from Brian. So again, five and five uh, is about to happen, and uh, we're going to close the vote. 
Uh, and uh, you're closing the vote, Naomi, so hopefully you voted yes, no, or undecided, uh, and uh, robots will eventually dominate the world and eliminate human abilities to earn wages. My friend Rudolf Hauser is going to be the timekeeper. Uh, Rudolf, uh, start timing Robin once he gets up to the podium. Five minutes for you, Robin, on the affirmative. I'm happy to be here debating my good colleague, Brian. I want to clarify first what I'm arguing for, maybe not extreme as you think. By robots, I just mean machines that substitute for people sometimes. Uh, I mean, by dominate, I mainly just mean the way the skyline is dominated by big buildings, that uh, the machines will eventually be the main activity where most of the main things happen and uh, dominate in some other sense partially. So far in history, over many centuries, we've had a slow progress of humans being displaced on particular jobs. And uh, at each moment, previously there was a job people were doing uh, and they were getting paid for it. And then people figured out a way to use a machine in a way that they could do better than the human. And then humans no longer did that task. And the price of doing that task went so far down that if a human tried to do it, they'd get a ridiculously low wage and it wouldn't be worth it. And that's what I mean by eliminate wages, not falling to zero, but below an ability to subsist a human. Uh, over all those centuries, uh, we've never really seen it go the other way. <laughs> we've never really seen humans take over a job that machines used to do. Uh, if it happens, it's very rare. So it looks like humans are not getting better as fast as machines are getting better. <laughs> Slowly over time, machines are just getting better. And I used to be an AI researcher, and I can tell you that all the different things humans seem to do, uh, it seems like uh, they aren't magic. There, there's no special thing that humans have that in some way eventually hu machines can't do. Machines can do physical things. Machines can calculate things. Machines can figure out algorithms. Now, the human mind, I accept, is enormously powerful and impressive, but I'm talking about centuries of evolution. So, Many people are saying huge things are about to happen in the next year or two or the next 10 or 20 years, and I'm not all about that. I think nothing special will happen in the next few decades compared to what's happened for centuries. Every few decades or a few years, we have another burst of automation, another burst of concern, and we're having one now. And I'm not talking about dramatic things, but think about centuries. Think about what was different centuries ago and how far we've come. And I'd say it seems like eventually we will slowly take more and more jobs because the machines are getting better and the humans aren't. Now, that's just what the familiar machines we're talking about. Actually, my book over here, The Age of M, is about what might happen if eventually we can make a substitute for a human brain much more specifically. We can model the human brain by actually mapping out the particular cell connections in a brain and seeing and then making a model of particular brains and doing that would be a much more direct substitute for humans. So if you could make a computer model that was a model of particular brains, then it has the same range of human, like the human abilities in terms of being able to love or get mad or do politics. And emulation machines like that have a much more plausible ability to substitute for humans. Once you can make them and they're cheaper from humans, then they could do pretty much everything better than humans can. Uh, but even if we never have emulations, I think eventually the other kinds of machines will slowly get better. And again, it's about humans not really getting better faster. Now, human wages have been going up consistently over a long time, and I think the best way to understand that is to say the number of humans hasn't been going up very fast. So we can vastly increase other kinds of capital, machines, building things like that, and because humans are so limited, the marginal product, the value of humans' work is increasing because they're so scarce. But once you have something that can substitute for a human, and you can make lots of it in factories, which is the way we do with machines, then the value on the margin goes way down and wages fall, and that's what's been happening each time a machine has done something that a human used to do. The value goes way down because we can make so many machines so fast, and when eventually we can make machines like emulations that can do pretty much everything humans do, then at that point it seems like uh, they uh, will do everything better and then humans will have to retire. Now, if humans eventually own the capital, own shares in companies that make robots, et cetera, then we can use that capital to get income. So humans can still live comfortable lives eventually when their ability to earn wages go away. But the claim here, again, is that if we slowly uh, make more and more better machines over centuries, they will keep taking away task after task that humans do. And eventually, 
people won't be able to earn much money by working, but you can still be rich and comfortable by owning other things in the world like real estate, uh, shares of stock and firms, things like that. And so uh, that's, I think, a relatively straightforward standard argument, at least from my point of view. This is the sort of subject people just feel emotional about, and I think uh, I, I would just ask you to just pause and try to accept that people see it from other points of view, but from my background in computer science and in physics, uh, this just seems the obvious point of view, but I look forward to debating Brian. <laughs> See this working? Yes, very good. Uh, so uh, you should all have uh, the handout of my slides since we don't have projection here. I call this against robotic panic. Now Robin is not actually panicking at all because he identifies so strongly with the robots, their victory will be his victory. Uh, but but uh, the scenario that is describing would generally scare people, so which is why I have this title. Uh, now, just to go over the resolution again, resolutions will eventually dominate the world and eliminate human abilities to earn wages. I disagree with both clauses, uh, partly because I, think, I interpret the words in the normal way. I think Robin is deliberately changing the definitions away from what would normally be used. Uh, although we can, we can talk about that in the conversation, because I think I've had many conversations with Robin where we use the words the normal way. And here, and here I think there is a change in the meaning. Uh, fortunately, you voted before you heard that, so. Uh, in any case, so I disagree with both clauses. So I say our most probable future is, first of all, one where robots dominate nothing, and second of all, where many humans no longer want to earn wages, but those who choose to work will earn more than they do today. Uh, now, again, like most humans, I consider this the optimistic result. Uh, but you could have Robin's evaluation and still say that I'm right about what's going to happen. All right, so let me give you an analogy. Uh, let us go back to the dawn of the domestication of animals. And as soon as we've got dogs that are helping us with hunting a little bit, as soon as we have a few chickens, someone comes along, a futurist, and says, domesticated animals will eventually dominate the world and eliminate human abilities to earn wages. All right, hmm, that seems like it's really jumping the gun. But uh, what would their arguments be? Well, uh, here's where I think they would start. First of all, look, we can improve these animals. We started off with wolves, now we got dogs. Eventually we're gonna have bigger and better dogs and smaller dogs and dogs that can do all sorts of things. All right, so we can improve these dogs and we can also rapidly breed them. We can rapidly breed them without any of the limitations that you normally have for human breeding. Like we can take the very best animals and just breed a ton of those and the other ones don't get to have any kids. All right, so seems like this would be a way that the, the progress of the domesticated animals could be very rapid. So, given that we can improve and rapidly breed them, you might then infer they'll eventually be smart and numerous enough to take over. All right, furthermore, uh, you might say the domestication will eventually yield animals so skilled that humans will be unable to compete with them in the labor market. So, and you might say, look, how or is a human hunter ever gonna compete with the super wolf that we will have developed after hundreds of years or after thousands of years? All right, now, as you know, none of this has happened yet. All right, uh, at least this is my view. None of this has happened yet. There's also no sign that it ever will. I don't know anyone says, look, so far domestication has worked out okay, but the animals are gonna get the upper hand eventually. <laughs> All right, now why has it not happened? Because I will say, if you go back 5,000 years ago and listen to this argument, it doesn't sound like a bad argument, but there have been a number of problems that have prevented this scenario from happening. So the least fundamental one is there's limits to how much domestication improves animals. There's a lot of stuff you can do to animals, but there is a limit about how far you can go. So you can take a wolf and you can get everything from a Great Dane down to a, uh, down, down, down to a, down to a poodle. So those are all things we've been able to do, but we haven't gotten a dog that can play chess. All right, we haven't gotten a dog that can speak. Uh, there's a famous experiment where a scientist raised a chimpanzee with his son to see whether the chimp would start speaking, and it didn't happen. All right, so that is, that is a point which again, you might say, well, just give it some more time. All right, but here's a much more fundamental reason why uh, animals have never come to dominate the world and are not going to, which is that animals are bred for docility to man. This is one of the main things we do to domestic animals. We go and kill the ones that resist, and we breed the ones that do what we say and do what we want and that serve us. This is a key point. There's a reason why the animals are not gonna rise against us is we have created the kind that would not want to rise against us. Uh, final point, uh, animal skills improve unevenly, so humans specialize in areas where they have a comparative advantage, which ultimately leads to higher human wages. All right, now, the relevance of the analogy. 
I'd say that the case for the resolution that Ar Robin is arguing in favor for is about as good as the case for my analogy, uh, which I mean as no disrespect, but that is my view. All right, so, and again, how would, how would that go? So since robots can rapidly improve and multiply, eventually they'll be smart and numerous enough to take over. Exactly the same argument that I gave before, but with robots replacing animals. Secondly, you could say robots will eventually be so skilled, humans will be unable to compete with the labor market. Again, I'm just doing find and replace animals for robots. Uh, and the rebuttal is, it is just about as good too. First of all, there are limits to how much robots improve. Uh, but secondly, more fundamentally, robots are programmed for docility to man. We build robots so they will do what we want. Right, uh, if they kill anyone, it is because a human being told the robot to kill somebody. It is not because they're doing it on their own. Finally, uh, robots improve skills unevenly, so humans will specialize in areas where they have a comparative advantage, ultimately leading to higher human wages. All right, uh, last quick point. So I'll try to rush this. This time is different. All right, but aren't robots different from domesticated animals in fundamental ways? Well, the robots that we can imagine are really different from animals because imagination is infinite. You can imagine anything, so of course I can imagine robots that are way better than dogs. However, the robots that we have seen are not that awesome. Uh, so far, we have two things. We got robots that are awesome at a narrow range of tasks, like computation, pure math, web search, assembly line production, and then we have robots that are okay at a broader range of tasks, like voice recognition and driving. All right now, uh, Robin often likes to say, and I agree with him, that X hasn't happened yet does not prove that X will never happen. Uh, but X has never happened yet, and it still, uh, is still one of the best arguments we have for so it is not going to happen. And this is especially true when X is a dramatic change that fires the human imagination. Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, this, yeah. Uh, you went a little bit over. Uh, so, uh, I want to get, we got 27 minutes remaining then. Give it 27 minutes, and then he went a little over. So uh, spend a few minutes attacking him back, please. Okay? <laughs> and then uh, we'll start our discussion. 27 minutes, go on. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> humans have been domesticating other humans. A standard story about how humans have been changing over time is that we have been self-domesticating. So it's an open question to what extent uh, the improvement of animals has been faster than the improvement of humans rel in terms of domestication. Uh, yes, you can have faster generation times for animals, but partly because uh, they're not as smart and, <laughs> and useful. But uh, I would just ask, uh, I would rather just ask Brian more directly, uh, what kind of tasks are, is it that you think machines can't do <laughs> eventually? That is, what, what's the special thing that eventually they won't be able to do? Or even domesticated animals, what, what, what's the special things that you think that, that will forever remain outside their abilities? Uh, so, I mean, I, like my, my first pass would be to say that the things that robots are not good at right now are things that they are likely to not remain very good in the future. Again, I believe that they will improve. And again, so coming up with an intellectually original argument, I don't think they're going to be good at that. Coming up with original music, I don't think they're going to be good at that. And again, so I think that, you know, there's just a lot of things that the, the world is full of. It's a huge world. So again, in the same way that if you were to say, what, what can't you train an animal to do? I don't know. I'm not an animal trainer. I'm not a computer programmer. All I can do is look around and say that the world is full of stuff, and the burden is on people who think that, it's, that, this, is, that this amazing thing is going to happen to show it will. Can I ask you a question, Robin? Uh, it, we, we know that robots can beat people at chess, and yet people still want to watch other people play chess. Uh, it, you can make more money as a, as a chess champion now than before the time the robots could beat us. Uh, robots can probably be better athletes, but people want to watch other people doing athletics. So isn't there a certain human bias, just for starters, about what people can do, even though in those two cases, robots can do them better? Uh I'm happy to admit that when we have lots of rich human customers, some of them will want a real human waiter. <laughs> and even if a robot waiter could look just the same, it, they will want the real human waiter. So there'll definitely be some remaining jobs with some wages just because of a bias for wanting the real human thing to do the job. Or you, even wanting to listen to music that was made by a real human musician. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's going to be a pretty small fraction of the economy, I would say. So I'm still going to focus on uh, saying most of the wages would be lost. I'd like to go back to the point about the com relative rate of improvement. So um, my, my basic claim is historically, we've only ever seen it go one way. Machines have slowly gotten better and taken over a job from the humans. Do you, do you accept that that has been the historical trend so far? So you are framing the question incorrectly. So the key thing is not whether, whether humans have ever been able to take a job away from a machine. The key question is, are humans and machines complementary? 
And that is what I say we have seen in a great many industries. There are many industries that would not exist at all but for machines. I was just flying on a plane. Without those planes, those, the, the planes, the pilots would not have jobs. The, the flight attendants would not have jobs. Uh, this is, you know, so I do teach labor economics, and this is one of the main things I teach my students, which is that whether or not technological innovation is good for the human workers in that occupation depends upon elasticity to product demand, and in industries where a fall in the price leads to a large increase in quantity, you actually get more employment when you get, when you have technological advance in that industry. So let me just break this down. Uh, we have many different tasks we do in the economy. Each job is a bundle of tasks. Tasks complement each other. So. When machines get better at their tasks, that makes the other tasks more valuable. And that's one reason to understand why human wages have risen is because mm -hmm. as the machines get better at the tasks they do, the tasks that humans still do uh, become more valuable on the margin because there's so mm -hmm. few humans compared to the ability to make far more machines. But the way I'd say it is on each task, humans have been substituted by machines. And we've only ever seen it on a task basis where the humans were once doing the task and then the machines start doing the task. Yes, of course, mm -hmm. there's complementarity across tasks mm -hmm. because when the mach machines take over a job as a task, then they do it better and cheaper and that raises the value of doing all the other tasks that need to be mm -hmm. done. But nevertheless, my claim is that each task specifically, we've only ever seen the machine displace the human on a task. So at risk of turning this into an economics lecture, uh, as long as you have especially rapid uh, machine advances in some areas, then even if the robots are, are improving in the other areas, still you have a net, a, a net increase in demand for, uh, for, for the human labor. So it still seems to me that you're wrong. But but if, so can I, can I, can I switch yes, over? Please. So on the domination issue, the great domination issue. Uh, so uh, when, you know, when, when I was reading Robin's description of what counts as domination, I think that you could all say that machines dominate the world already. In which case, this is a very silly debate to be having. You could already say, look, like, like the, the machines are all over the place. They're doing, they're doing, they're, you know, they're doing most of the horsepower. Uh, you know, if you if you just do it based upon visibility, you might say buildings dominate society now. I don't think this is what any any normal person and even you mean by by domination. I think by domination you mean who calls the shots, who actually decides what happens. If uh, if uh, if one group decides they want something different to happen, does that thing happen or does it not? So you know, so I dominate my uh, I dominate my children in my household. If I think that we should be doing something else, then we do that thing. Uh, there's more of them, uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, I nevertheless I boss them around and they do what I say, right? Uh, so I mean, I would say in the same way. As long, you know, there could be a very small number of humans, a vast number of robots, but if the robots are serving us and producing a bunch of things we want without ever without ever a minute spare time for themselves then we are dominating them regardless of the biomass or whatever other measure you want to have. So why don't you agree with that? So to a libertarian audience, I'd say, instead of thinking who rules the world and tells everybody else what to do, imagine a world, a capitalist world with lots of people with different wealth, and then say, sure, there might be some humans who on the margin are like retirees today who have some money and they spend it and in their sphere of their grocery shopping, et cetera. They, they call the shots on the details they're paying attention to, but most of the world, most of the detail of the world, they are not calling the shots. They don't even understand it. So the more of economic activity that the robots do, then the less the humans are doing. So in terms of, we talked about wages, that is, today, humans earn most wages. Uh, e most in the income that computers and machines get is small compared to the income that humans get. So if you, uh, in fact, as an you alien, might say they don't earn income at all. They're owned by a person. They don't get anything. <laughs> the, most of the work is being done by the humans. So in ter we can we can look at the whole, the machines, whoever they're owned by, they're getting a small fraction of income today. But eventually, when humans do a small fraction of the jobs and the machines are doing almost all of it, I would say that's a world dominated by machines because machines are doing almost everything and almost everything that's worth doing and almost all the value is being created by the machines. So does Mark Zuckerberg dominate Facebook or not, according to you? It sounds like he doesn't. He's the CEO, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> In a world where there's one Mark Zuckerberg at the top and tens of thousands of other people, yes, the employees dominate Facebook, and one guy at the top, he can't pay attention to that many things. He doesn't understand most of the things going on. He can Who cares? Make a He's in charge. He gets the money. He tells them <laughs> what to do. If he wants something different to happen, it happens. Well, like, who cares about the details? That's really weird. So let's go to docility. So because <laughs> you're focused on this idea that they're all just uh, abject slaves worshiping their masters, uh, hardly able to look them in the eye or even talk back. Uh, but... Honestly, uh, 
in a future where we have not just robots of the sort we've had today, but robots that are copies of human minds, they would have all the same human uh, personality, tastes, and styles of thinking, and attitudes. And so their styles, in terms of being submissive or docile, should be the sort that we expect in a competitive labor economy where the uh, most highly product the highest productivity workers are the ones being chosen. So uh, today, if you look around you, you see uh, many different workers that are uh, command different wages. And in a future world where we make copies of particular human brains and we make machine versions of them and we sell them, in that world, they will want to pick the very best humans, the most productive, and make many copies of them and train them in that way. So the best guess for what those workers are like in terms of their attitudes and their styles and thinking would be the styles and thinking of the most productive workers today. So many of you probably know very high paid uh, hard-working, workaholic even people. Many of you may be those people. <laughs> and uh, if you ask, what are those people like? They get along on their job, of course, mostly. They, they, they do what they're told in many ways in terms of working in a company and having a job, but they're not docile in any ordinary sense of the word. High productivity workers know when to get along and when to submit, and they also know when to do the opposite, as is appropriate in their particular situation. That's what I would predict for robots who are basically copies of individual humans who then uh, dominate the economy by being much cheaper and much better. Most animals are not docile either. In fact, most animals are very vicious. But the ones that we domesticated were different. We deliberately picked out the ones that are docile, that would cooperate with us. Every generation we went and killed the ones that were resisting to get ever more docile ones. You know, was, and again, so here, so again, so Rob, you know, so one of my main complaints about Robin is Robin is so brilliant that he will leap ahead to his conclusion without giving people necessary background. So if you don't <laughs> mind, uh, so, I mean, so Robin is thinking that we'll have whole brain emulation, so we'll be able to go and take particular people and make and make billions of copies of them. And so if you were, and, you know, and he very reasonably says, well, if we could do this, we would go and take really productive people. I say, yes, that's true, but we're also going to be looking for some other things, including people that will do exactly what we tell them without complaining or asking for stuff. If, you know, if you could go and copy one, per, uh, copy one mind to become your robot, would you want to have someone talking back to you and bargaining and asking for money? No, you would go and get. So you would go and find. And I know a few people like this. People who are super nice. They're competent, but they also don't ask for much. They are they are loyal, dutiful, and submissive. And again, so why is the people don't like like this? Don't dominate the world. There isn't an industry of creating people like this. They right are now, not human beings are created by, created by sex not by some effort to serve your corporate paymasters. So it's a totally different system. Brian, if you, if you go talk to any boss in the world mm -hmm. around you today, they would say, yes, all elk e equal. They would, of course, love a docile employee who doesn't ask for much money and does, yes, yes sir, yes, sir. But when you're choosing employees, it's not the only consideration. And today, people often choose rather aggressive, <laughs> even somewhat abrasive employees because that's correlated with other features of being productive. Very but, but smart, in your very scenario, capable They've got people. seven billion people to choose between. Like a normal employer may be stuck between five choices. One's docile, but isn't very smart. Another one's smart, but not so docile. If you've got seven billion people, it's the you, same. Can, you can find the sweet spot. Someone who's got everything you're looking for, practically. So why wouldn't they do that? Again, there's a trade-off. You can't have everything you want because things come as trade-offs with other parameters. Many of you know when you're looking at personalities of people to hire, people who are very docile are often inadequate in other ways. It's not a random fact about the world. It's part of a person. You want an aggressive person. You often want a person who is gunning for your job <laughs> because that's the sort of person who we're going to work very hard and is very ambitious and it's going to pay a lot of attention and is sharp. You want people like that working for you. That's how it works today in the economy. Very few people are seeking extremely docile employees in the work today. And that's how it would be in the future. If you're looking for robots, you're looking for capable, uh, productive, ambitious, smart, uh, just who, docile, who not also useful. don't ask for money and don't give and don't give you trouble. Uh, may, I, may I jump in for a moment? <laughs> Actually, Brian has inspired me. It, it is true, as he suggests, that I believe, Robin, that the seven billion choices and uh, you know, you and I and Brian, we could make a fortune establishing a firm that would tweak it perfectly so that we could f emulate people who uh, occasionally you do meet them in life. They're very energetic, innovative, and the rest, but they're not greedy. They're not difficult. And so we would say, we've got the perfect person. We're going to stamp for you. The very world that you're talking about 
can improve, and we, and we don't have to make do with the trade-offs. The, the fortune could be made from turning out those emulations that are both nice, cooperative, and yet brilliantly creative. You don't have to make do with the trade-offs, possibly, in the world that you're describing. Wouldn't you say that that's potentially a problem from your standpoint? Let, let me put this a little perspective. Human brains are enormously powerful. Uh, we've been making software and artificial machines for many decades, and yet, by comparison with the human brain, they are really quite inadequate. I'm happy to agree with Brian that so far, humans are where the action's at in terms of powerful software and hardware that just is extremely capable. Many people have this intuition that when finally machines displace humans, they will throw away almost all of the features of the human brain that uh, are of the things we love because they, we sort of feel like the features we most love, like uh, playfulness or falling in love or back-talking or things like that, are just accidental stupid features that you would just get rid of if you were an intelligent designer. But I think that's just the wrong way to think about the human mind. The human mind has been honed over evolution, a long age of evolution, and all of the different parts of your mind are there for a reason. They evolved because they helped something in your distant ancestors. Y yes, you're to advance your genetic interests, but if you're creating another creature to serve you, you're going to be thinking about your own interests, not its interests. It's not about the genetic interests. It's about a strong, powerful design that's very functional and useful. The, f the habit of talking back or questioning your boss isn't some random thing that's useless. It's because it was functional in many ways. If you want, again, if you... Brian, if you start a business and you just try or hire lots of docile people, I predict that just won't go very well. Docile people are just not the best employees. If I had my pick of seven billion people, it would be a different story. Then I'd no, get people still who combine. The same. I would get people who combine all virtues, and seven billion is enough to get those people. But, and again, business would be created to tr to turn out that ideal point because they'd say Robin Hanson points out that you don't want those emulations, those robots rebelling against you. You want to tweak it perfectly so they cooperate. But uh, in any case. Uh, Brian, do you want to raise some other issue? Sure, uh, sure. Let's take a, mm. take a... So th this this is a little bit of a pet point, but I, uh, I I was very surprised that Robin said that the main thing that's had the main reason why human wages have gone up is just that we haven't been able to increase the number of people as fast as other things have gone up. I think we've actually talked about this before. So, uh, so my view, there is a very large economic benefit to population growth, which is that the the root cause of progress is new ideas, and more people means more ideas. Uh, you really can see this historically in areas that are I uh, isolated areas with low populations. They have very low rates of innovation. So, I mean, ro again, Robin is sort of bringing in a Malthusian model of, of the last few hundred years, which I just think is wrong. Uh, I think you have to imagine uh, an entire model. There's a whole literature on things that cause growth. Growth is great. One parameter is population. I think that if you hold other parameters constant and you vary population, I think you do get a falling marginal productivity. I think over in the long run, you reduce innovation, but uh, the key thing is if population can grow faster than innovation can produce increasing wealth, then still per capita wealth falls. So just, just let's go back for a minute. A thousand years ago, our world was dominated by subsistence farmers. Subsistence farmers were really fantastically productive creatures compared to pretty much all animals who have ever lived. Nevertheless, the economy only doubled roughly every thousand years, and it was we could grow the population of humans faster than every thousand years. So even though humans were really quite impressively productive, we grew humans so fast that the marginal product of each human fell down to subsistence wages. That wasn't because humans weren't very powerful and productive compared to all the animals there. It was just because the economy was growing slower than you could grow the population. It, today, we can't grow the population as fast as we grow the economy, and so per capita wealth has been increasing. But in the future, if we find any way to make substitutes for humans really fast, faster than the economy can grow, then the per capita wages should fall down to near subsistence, and that's what my claim in the future is, that we'll find some way to make a substitute for humans, or even perhaps humans, faster than we can grow the economy. It, the, there are many things that contribute to innovation. Population is one of them, but it's not the only one. Right. So again, I took you to be making a historical claim about the last few centuries. I think you did. Is that wrong? I make the claim that holding other things constant. So imagine today all the same mm -hmm. infrastructure, the same buildings, the same machines, the same roads, etc. And imagine holding all that constant and increasing the population by a factor of 100. <laughs> Trying to mm -hmm. cram all those 100 people into the small buildings around and the small roads. I predict in that scenario, the marginal product of the marginal person goes way down. Yeah, so, the so innovative so, so, rate so, so, of growth may go up then, but still, 
those people can't earn much wages if we just imagine the same infrastructure today and a hundred times as many people. Yeah, so I'm very comfortable making that prediction as a short run prediction, but as to whether there would be vastly higher economic growth of the longer run when you have populations hundred times higher seems totally reasonable to me. There might well be higher growth, but again, if growth the population... Growth in, ca- in per capita as well. No, no. If the population can increase faster than this growth you're talking about, still the wages come down to a low wages. That's the key point. It's about the relative growth rates. Looking forward, though, I I take it, Robin, you are predicting uh, that something like output doubling every couple of months, you're predicting unimaginable riches, probably will have a a five-day weekend or four-day weekend, (laughs) lots of of demand for uh, amusements, lots of demand for masseurs, uh, rabbis, sex workers, uh, <laughs> people like that, things that people can do and that entrepreneurs would want to employ them in. But you are, in any case, predicting unimaginable riches for the world. So just to be clear, I'm not talking about anytime soon. I'm talking about eventually when slowly machines take away the jobs until they take away pretty much all the jobs. At that point, if humans still own a lot of wealth, you can be rich and enjoy spending that wealth so you can have a seven-day weekend because yeah. there's you're out of work, so you yeah. might as well spend all your time. Uh, It also turns out that a limitation on the growth rate of the economy today is the fact that we can't grow humans very fast. So the fact that we can grow machines really fast, but the human population is limited, is a limit on the growth rate. Once you can take that limit away, that is, once you can make substitutes for humans really fast in factories as fast as you make stuff in factories today, the economy can grow much faster than today, uh, plausibly even doubling every month. So these rich humans enjoying whatever wealth they have, that wealth could double every month. But that's somewhat of... that. Growth rate change isn't really the focus of our conversation, but yes, well, eventually. But now, I have to admit, collectively, humans, we get very rich, but whether any one human does okay does depend on how much they have. So it, it is true that a large fraction of the population today can't really put together $500 to deal with a, an immediate expense. A lot of people really have put pretty much all of their eggs into the ability to earn wages basket. If they don't find some way to diversify their assets, to have some sort of insurance or sharing arrangements, they could plausibly be in trouble. You were saying, Brian, that uh, you, in your view, uh, anybody who wants a job will probably be able to find one. Are you, are you were also suggesting that lots of people just won't work because there'll be government welfare. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I mean, it, it could be welfare, but I was just saying that if there, really, if there actually were a robot economy that led to a very large increase in production, the, as I always tell my students, the secret of mass consumption is mass production. The robots are drastically increasing production. Living standards will go up by a lot. And in that case, I think there are a lot of people who would rather just work, work a very small amount and enjoy life because a lot of people have jobs that aren't very fun. So, um, but you see, yes. you, you, you have no fear that, uh, that, that people will find work if they want to find work. That's what you're saying. Uh, I mean, it says, you know, like, like right now, of course, there are some people who seem to have a great deal of trouble holding down a job, uh, although you know, a lot of that has to do with minimum wages and things like that that's, um, that make it unprofitable to employ lower productivity people. But yeah, I mean, now you can, it's, you know, am I afraid of it? No, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, uh, so, so I had a question for Robin. So I encourage everyone to read Robin's book. It's an it's a extremely interesting book. I've had a number of arguments with Robin. Now, it seems to me that in your watering down of the word dominate, you are running away from the thesis of your own book, because uh, what I read your book as saying is that robots will dominate the world in the full-blown Terminator matrix sense, where robots control things and human beings had better play along, or they'll get eliminated, or maybe they will be eliminated. Uh, so Robin does have a whole story about how humans will get to live like retirees in the same way that we don't euthanize our retirees because they're parasites on the system. Similarly, the robots will not euthanize we humans because we're, we, are, we, are, we, are, uh, we are parasites in the system. But uh, if you read Robin carefully, he also has a view, which is interesting, saying that the robots could, ha- could run at such a high speed that the robots would subjectively experience thousands of years in what would only be a, uh, a couple of years of human time. And my story there is, look, it it may very well be that the first five generations of robots will be happy to keep humanity around because they feel some residual gratitude towards us. But after a thousand generations from their point of view, the robots are saying, wait, who are these people and why do we have to keep doing this stuff for them and why do they keep collecting? Like, what are they even? Right? And here's the key thing is the thousand generations from their point of view could only be a few years from our point of view. So I believe, Robert, Robin may disagree, that I actually did get him to say, yeah, actually it is pretty plausible these robots will kill off mankind within a few y- human, human perceived years. Which, yeah, that's about as, domination, as bad a domination scenario as you can get. 
So I mean, it does seem to me that is it ta uh, implicit in Robin's book. He doesn't so, actually talk about the. I don't think you did. You mention the Terminator in the book? I don't remember. I don't. No, but, I didn't mention. The, so let me try to yes. be clear. Uh, we have had three great ages of humans so far. There was the forager era, where they doubled roughly every quarter million years, very slow growth. Then the farming doubled roughly every thousand years. And then in industry, we've been doubling roughly every 15 years. Uh, as these eras, growth has gone faster, each era has gotten shorter. So if a next era comes, well, that's even faster growth, plausibly, say, doubling every month, if it was going to go through roughly the same number of doublings as the previous eras, then it would only last a year or two, and then something else would happen. And so for the purpose of my book, I was only going to talk about that era and not make a prediction about what happens there. It's just a basic fact about accelerating change, that the faster change comes, the closer in the future you get a point in time where you say, I don't know what happens then. So that's the point of the book, is to say, I can't give you any assurances about the long-term future. It's not my, I'm not trying to give you any assurances about the long-term future. I'm just going to say, what happens next and what might be. Let, let me be clearer about this domination point for wages. So imagine that you can create these M's, I call them, brain emulations. You're a capitalist and you can make them. And contrary to Brian's claim, you don't always pick the most docile ones. <laughs> you I pick never, the local, never said that, Robin. You pick the ones that are locally most productive for you as a capitalist uh, in order to make the most money. So you will pick some that, that have their own. And you might even, instead of making them slaves, you might make them uh, indentured servants or free workers so that they can apply, earn their own capital. Now, it's a basic fact about investment that many of you may know that private investors who are combined the role of owner and manager get higher rates of return than distant. If you invest in a public company as a separating the role of owner and manager, you get a lower rate of return. So if these emulations who are on the job owning capital and running their own enterprises, they will get a higher rate of return than the humans. So slowly over time, the wealth owned by these emulations would grow relative to the wealth by, owned by humans, and so eventually they would come to dominate the wealth in the economy. Now, once they are the main thing, of course, eventually there could be wars and revolutions and all sorts of things could happen. But even in a peaceful scenario, yes, eventually the humans are off to the side, focused uh, with fewer resources and less control. The, ro the robots would own property? They'd be allowed to own capital and yeah, property? That would be my prediction, well, because that makes them more productive workers. Well, okay, uh, the human beings may object to that. They're often very Some racist. humans, but the others will do what it takes to make the most money. Okay. Um, uh, do you have, uh, we have about 30 seconds to go in terms of your dialogue. Do you want to lash back, uh, Brian? <laughs> sure. What is your probability that biological humans survive the first human perceived year of the age of M? Uh, 70? Seven. <laughs> so 30% 30, 30 chance for a full-blown Terminator scenario. So, yes, that is domination, not in the sense of there's, that, that they're big or anything like that. That is, uh, that is domination in a truly terrifying sense, which, you know, fortunately, I think Robin's completely wrong about this. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we've both been beating up on Robin. Uh, the audience <laughs> could get their chance to. Please line up in front of the mics, uh, in front of the one mic over there, and, uh, so that we can hear your questions. Uh, we're going to fix up. A, we, we're going to line. Uh, the people should be lined up uh, toward the... Uh, Toward my, uh, excuse me, my left, uh, and uh, so uh, whoever is grabbing the mic first, uh, please. Uh, and we're going to set up some chairs for people who, who don't want to sit. So uh, I see. Uh, so there's a gentleman over there who's next to the mic. Please ask. So please uh, ask your question as a question with a question mark. Uh, if you want to have real arguments with Robin uh, and Brian, uh, we could have that over drinks afterwards, but ask the question now. Please uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm Jason. Uh, you're proposing that these robots have the desire for material gain, the desire for sex, and the desire for social standing based upon your presentation. The question is, your world seems to believe or propose to believe that these robots wish to make money, wish to have a social standing, and wish to have sex. Is that your proposition? Thanks for the question. Go ahead. I, you didn't direct who the question was at, but I presume no, it was. No, the question <laughs> is to Robert. You're the right. affirmative. Robert, Robert, Robert. Yes, of course. So uh, 
there's two parts of our discussion here. One is we've been talking about robots in general, all the different kind of robots that could exist, and then I specialized at one point to talking about a certain kind of robot, a brain emulation, who is much more a model of a particular human. So brain emulations almost by definition would have all the human styles and attitudes, including all the things you mentioned. So yes, if emulations are possible and eventually cheaper than humans, then they would take over human jobs and have all those features. I mean, within, within Raman's framework, his answer makes perfect sense. So if the framework's wrong, then he's wrong. And if it's right, he's right, he's right. Okay, uh, question. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, so here's my question. Uh, and and I, I, one of the problems, of course, this evening is that I think that some of us have been thinking about these problems and have a bit, big, better framework for, for thinking about them than others. Uh, I've been hearing Robin talking about this for 25 years now, one way or another. <laughs> as, question, as, question to whom? So the question, whom? So the question is this. To whom? It's, 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 it's more to Brian, but it's to both of you. Why wouldn't the capitalists want to be M's? I mean, an M is better in almost every way. You think thousands of times faster. You're probably capable of making upgrades to the way to your ability to think, which is something that's very difficult to do to flesh. Uh, I would certainly want to be an M. Uh, a Y, you know, I mean, you get, you, you get all the benefits. You can live in a virtual reality world. It looks like the world around you but, you, but you get to be thousands of times more productive and thus potentially make thousands of times more capital accumulation, given the fact that there would be an attraction even to humans to wanting to, to join up with the bandwagon, why would we assume that the M's would necessarily be passive, docile, you know, machines that you know you sit off in the corner like chickens? Uh, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, so, so Robin is basing his whole story, as I understand, on the capitalist system, where there are people right now who want workers, and if they could get their, their workers some other way, that would be great. Uh, sort of this consumption use of becoming a brain emulation is a very different model. I don't think Robin talks about it very much. Uh, so I would point out that right now, most people that I've talked to don't uh, actually, I, you know, I would love to have a twin. I don't. Most people I've asked, would you wish you had a twin? Most people already say no, which seems weird to me, but they don't even want to have a twin. Uh, but in any case... Uh, you know, becoming an M would be extremely disappointing because after you went through the brain emulation process, uh, well, so, like, well, actually, in Robin's first scenario, actually, you're dead because they have to actually slice your brain into pieces. So uh, I think very few people actually would like to have biological death in order for there to be a computer simulation of them going around, but uh, you may be different. There, uh, there, uh, I agree that there is heterogeneity here. Uh, based upon your view of personal identity. My view is that would be dead, I would be dead, and then there would be a, it would be basically like an animated statue of me, which uh, doesn't do anything for me at all. Uh, but in any case, even if it were a non-destructive kind of emulation, that would mean that you still exist. Perry's still there, living his life, and then there's a copy of Perry on a computer somewhere. As to what's so great about that, or how much you would pay for that, um, we could in, We could well, stipulate an incremental yeah, upload. Perry, asked oh. you asked a question, we're going to want to get to the next one. But Robin, we want you to comment. So I think Brian's the sort of person who wouldn't step into the Star Trek transporter. He'd have all these philosophies about, oh, no, that wouldn't be me on the other end. It'd be some other creature, and no, no, I'm about to die. I, I, I think I, I most want to know people, how it works. <laughs> I want to know how it works. I think most people, even if they knew it destroyed you here and made a version of you over there, they'd be okay with stepping into the transporter after they saw a dozen people do it and come back, and that they all looked okay. And I think that's the attitude people will have to this emulation thing. Now, today, it's the weird thing you can't conceive, but once lots of other people are doing it, and they walk, they seem okay, and they talk just like the original does, then you'd say, ah, fine. Thanks for your question, Perry. Next question, please. Yeah. All right, this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, a couple of years ago, a uh, popular YouTube blogger, his name is CGP Gray, came out with this video called Humans Need Not Apply, and it was talking about uh, eventually machines will become better than humans in absolutely everything, and then humans will simply be unhirable or unemployable. And this sparked a lot of conversation about a uh, basic income guarantee. So I haven't actually heard a lot of economists or libertarians in particular talk about the basic income guarantee, and spe especially in response to that particular video. So I don't know if you've seen it, I hope you have, uh, but no, respond if you care. If it... The basic income guarantee in the world that you describe, anybody want to comment? Uh... I said that it would be wise for people to have some form of assets or insurance or sharing arrangements to prepare for the time when they lose their ability to earn wages. Some forms of basic income guarantee could function in that way, but I wouldn't advocate any particular solution. I'd just say find a solution, make it work. 
Uh, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I say, you know, the basic income guarantee is one of the most inefficient ways of helping people I've ever heard because it involves giving money to everyone. That is stupid. Give money to a sm to, to the people who actually are going to be starving to death in the streets if you're going to give it to anyone. Give me, uh, but to give it to every person? Like, what is the point? Why should Bill Gates also be getting some basic income? It doesn't, I mean, it just means that you need to have much higher taxes in order to go and have this meaningless, first we take some money from you, then we give it back to you while distorting incentives and having transactions costs on top. So basic income guarantee is, a bad, is bad regardless of technology and including with robots. I, I, uh, next. I'd warn against the one grand solution to everything, okay? <laughs> that is, we can, if there are risks that are coming up, we can insure against them at many different scales. You can insure against them within your family, within your firm, within your city, within your nation. I, I would honestly not count, count on it happening in any one place and therefore not worrying about it. I would do what I could at whatever level you can to deal with these problems. Looks like they, uh, they both Thank agree you. about that. Uh, next question, please. Hi. Uh, would you say that tractors and other machinery have dominated uh, farm laborers in the last 30 years? Absolutely. <laughs> Not just yes. in the last, for, it's been a lot longer than that, yeah, but yes, yeah, yeah. of course. Yes. yes. When I say that as a bizarre violation of the English language to say that tractors are dominating anyone. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Robin, you were saying that uh, you expect that many people, perhaps most, would not make enough wages to subsist. But in a scenario, at least in the limiting, first of all, machines don't get wages. So any product that's made is, I mean, why do you pay for something that requires energy? Because people ultimately have to do the mining, have to build the transmission lines, et cetera. In a world where robots are making all of these things, doing all of these things without human effort, the things would cost essentially nothing. So what would it matter that people, are, what would it mean to say that people aren't earning subsistence wages? If people own these factories or these robots or other things, then they own something that's giving them an income and then they can have an income. If they don't own any of those things, they were just counting on being able to work to, to, to live, then they're in trouble. So uh, in a world where machines do pretty much mm -hmm. everything, if you don't have some what? other source of income, you're in trouble. Uh, if I, no, no. Yes, but if productivity is incredibly high, then you might only need to work for a few minutes a year in order to no. eat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your question. We, we want to get on to all the questions. You can talk to these guys later because they'll be available. So uh, go ahead with the next question. Okay. First, thank you. I feel today is a young girl in the Soviet Union in the 70s. Um, then it was very, there was very popular such discussions when very serious people was talking about that by 2000, all physical work would be done by robots and all humans will be poets and dancers and artists. <laughs> and that by 2000, um, uh, our civilization will be the member of intergalactic civilization and it was very serious, and was on the west and on the, on the east. And we control the weather, and will be everywhere, will be the peace. Uh, and you say, and, and what, question and what, is, and what question, is your question? What's yes, question? and question is, where I can file a complaint? Why it did not happen by 2000? Why we all, why we all busier than ever evoke much more than it was in 50s, 60s, and 70s. Thank you. That, that's a very tough act to follow, Robin. You want to go ahead. Yes. It, it's very hard to get people to talk about the non-immediate future. <laughs> so we can, many people from many decades, even centuries, have talked about this issue coming up. But when it gets in the wider discussion, people immediately want to focus on something happening in the short run because that's just much more engaging. And so people make these grandiose claims about short run. And we've seen that over and over again. I, in the 1980s, was a young 20-something who heard about artificial intelligence being great there and about to take over everything there, and I went to work in that field because I thought it was about to do everything, and I was just wrong because I believed the hype at that time, and I've learned better now, and I don't think it's about around the corner. And you will, for the next decades, every once in a while, hear people tell you it's all about to take over, and machines will take over all the jobs in a few decades, and then you'll be disappointed again and again and again, but eventually, slowly, machines are taking over the jobs. Comment? So two things. So first of all, where can you file a complaint? Here is a great place. So you come, you come to the great, right place. Uh, secondly, just on Robin. Uh, so I agree that there are a lot of grandiose predictions about big things coming soon. 
And uh, uh, honestly, a big part of my complaint is that you make grandiose predictions about things coming eventually. And they're both wrong. <clears throat> Next question. Probably. Right. A little closer to home. A little closer to home here. Um, Self-driving cars. Where are we going with that? Where is it going to be in five years? What's it going to look like? Robin, you're the expert. I'm not actually the expert, but uh, not that far in five years. Uh, these things take a while. It can't well, go very far in five years. Hmm. Or ten all, years. All, all, all I know is that our resident pessimist, Tyler Cowen, has actually becoming optimistic, which <laughs> makes me think, oh, my God, maybe it will happen soon. Um, in 20 so, years, maybe. Yes. Not in five. Uh, it just needs to happen in time for my Im irresponsible seven-year-old to not have to drive. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Good luck with that. Next question. Um, for both of you, how would you determine uh, true self-aware artificial intelligence um, who is uh, deserving of rights of life, liberty, property? Uh, I don't think my opinions about who's deserving of rights will make much difference in the world. <laughs> Honestly, uh, it's when they demand their rights <laughs> that uh, they're more likely to get them. So when the machines look like the people around you in this room and they're just as articulate and they're really uh, quite capable not only of beating you in jobs but in, uh, you know, beating you in politics, then uh, you'll probably have to take them seriously. So I would just say that, you know, that you know, Robin's story, at least for the 20th century, is wrong. It's not the case that people got the rights because they got power in order to demand them. They got the rights because people with power decided that they were treating them wrongly. So I mean, so you know, that so you know, that that is that is how slavery ended. That's how imperialism ended. It's how a great many other things ended. So I actually think it is very important whether 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 people think that someone is or is not deserving rights. Uh, in terms of you know, when I would decide that a robot was you know, what, you know, was deserving of rights. Uh, I'm not sure that I would ever think that because, you know, you know, for the same reason that you, know, like you could, ha you, know, you could have you know, a machine that was able to do it, you know, extremely detailed things. But if I wasn't convinced that it actually was conscious or felt pain, then I would not think that it deserves rights. I would just think this is a great simulation. If there were a novel that was totally immersive and made me believe the characters were real, I would still not think the book was conscious. Uh, similarly. The fact that you have a simulation of a, of a human mind, which is very convincing, still I would want to go and open it up. Uh, if this seems to, uh, to just be an odd view, I would say that every episode of The Twilight Zone that I ever saw had the same theme. Uh, namely, people, uh, if you have a very good copy of a person, people treat it like a person until they open it up and say, oh my god, it's just a bunch of cogs inside of there. In that case, it's not really a person and it doesn't, isn't really conscious, it just seems conscious. And so we will treat it very differently. So that is my view about what should be done. Humans Although, don't look so yes. impressive if you open them up yes. either. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they, look like, they, look, they look like I do inside, presumably. Yeah, but, you don't look so yeah. impressive inside. Yes. I, I, didn't, I didn't say impressive. Do they, look, do they look like they are animals? Which is what almost everybody thinks is actually conscious or things that are animals. So uh, if, if, yes. if there were a robot to uh, freedom civil war, would you two fight each other? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as a pacifist, no. I would just get under, uh, get get into the deepest bunker and hide. Thank you. I'm not making any commitments to fight any <laughs> wars for anybody. <laughs> no, thank right, next, you. Next question. So, given the fact that whenever whoever invents these robots moving forward are going to be able to own a lot of the technological advance and gain a lot of capital for themselves, and given the policies. Um, regarding the push for income distribution, especially in America now, don't you see the fact that people are go that income will be distributed through taxes because it'll be at no expense because there'll be so much overconsumption from the robots producing everything. So then, won't population increase because we'll have a dramatic surplus in all of our production, like we saw through the Industrial Revolution? Uh, again. If the growth rate of the economy becomes much faster, then the growth rate of humans even increasing still makes very little difference. Humans just can't increase their numbers very fast. If the economy is doubling every month, that, or even every year, that just swamps humans having more population. I certainly wouldn't predict more redistribution just because humans are richer. Uh, a lot of things go into how much redistribution there is, but mere wealth isn't a huge factor. Uh, ne you comment? No. Uh, okay, uh, next question. Thank you both for coming. Um, apparently I'm musical. Um, so I, I, I kind of have a two-part question, but I think I want to just focus on the fact that, well, for example, we see planes and cars, and I want to know why you think, you know, once we have, uh, you know, human-like robotics, 
that somehow changes. Like we don't play, we don't pay a plane. We pay the people who own the plane to use the plane. Why do you believe that we would start paying these people? I, I understand that you know these individuals, uh, these robotic individuals, would somehow uh, amass their own capital. But I just don't understand how that would really work itself out in a, in a real world. I see more of a high level owned by a Fortune 500 company. You know that CEO taking the funds, not the individual um, robots themselves taking the funds. Can you please talk to more about that? Well, as one person mentioned before, uh, many people will be tempted to move over and become emulations, uh, to take their wealth with them and their freedom and their non-docility. Would you? Uh, yes, I would. So, uh, and I think, imagine a thousand years ago, so you had told subsistence farmers, uh, you know, within a thousand years ago, there's, there's going to be this industrial revolution. There's a whole new industrial era. You could have thought to yourself, well, that's just terrible. We subsistence farmers are going to get pushed to the side, and we're not going to dominate the world. Or you could have said to yourself, gee, I should train my children and their grandchildren to think about joining this industrial world, to become uh, living in the city, learn how to work in far factories, etc., to be become part of the world. I think that's just an attractive thing. If you see the action is going to go in a new place, and you could move there and become part of it, a lot of people would work really want to win and be part of the winning, uh, you know, growing part of the world rather than sitting off on the side and saying, I'm not part of it. They, they won't take me just as I am. Why don't I change and become what works over there? Comment? Yes, I mean, again, this to me, I mean, I've been having this argument with Robin for a very long time. I'd say, look, Robin can no more become a robot than he can become a toaster <laughs> you know, or, or that he become a statue. You know, it just, uh, 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 you know, what would happen in a Robin scenario is that Robin uh, is that, well, so if it's destructive emulation, then Robin would die, and then there would be a copy of him that would, on the surface, seem very similar, but would be dead inside. And all the joy of, Re of Robin would actually be gone. Uh, now, this, of course, depends upon a whole issue of philosophy of mind. I do agree that there are some people that would see things this way, and I think it's fair for Robin to say that if it's only a small part of the population, then eventually it would, be a large, it would eventually be a large number of people because you would copy this so much cheaply. Which again, so that just means that if Robin's, scenario, if Robin's basic scenario makes sense to you, then Robin's conclusion also makes sense. On the other hand, if what he's saying seems crazy, then this is another crazy, logically deduced implication of a crazy view. Most people would step into the transporter. <laughs> <laughs> no Star Trek fans would. Other people would like to know what Most happens, how would. it works. Uh, next question. Hi. Um, my question is, well, once there's a breakthrough in quantum computers and quantum mechanics, it's, there's no doubt that computers, there's no question of docility because computers are just going to replace us. <laughs> they have infinite brain power, infinite memory, and instant ability to communicate with, with one another. So in that case, they're just going to be the ultimate creator. Um, my question, I like Brian's point in that in that, in that that future, there's perfect production, right, in which there's infinite production and all goods are free. But in that case, um, why would humans choose to work? And then if they do choose to still want to create and still have imaginative power, what, what, what point, how would they, right, because there is this species that's going to be more intelligent than us, why would another human want to create? What would they want to create? And how would they earn, what, what would, their need or what would be, they be fulfilling? And I think there's another future that we haven't really talked about, which is um, more scary in that if we have the affluent few who, who create, who, who, who discover this new species faster than we do, right? And then they take over and create the human droid, right? How do we prevent, what is the solution for a future in which there are a few, right? A select few at the top who become these human droids that control everything, this tyrannical world, and you know, how do we stop them from oppressing us? Because right? Uh, right now there's a limit to, to knowledge and a limit to, to money. Brian, would you take that question first? Yeah, I mean, so you know, in Robin's scenario, there probably is no way of preventing it. Fortunately, I think the scenario is not going to happen. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Robin. <laughs> Again, it comes down to uh, whether you're willing to think of these other things as your descendants and what you could become. Uh, if you think you're intrinsically human and a robot intrinsically can't be you, and I think Brian thinks this way, that any robot is so far from what you are as to be worthless from your point of view as a descendant of you, then you think this is a terrible thing because those other aliens are taking over. But 
There are some kinds of robots that would be very much like you. A brain emulation is very much like a human. It talks like you, it remembers like you, it is, falls in love like you, and all those sorts of things. And so if it's taking over, it's more like the industrialists taking over from the farmers. Yes, they have a different way of life and they have different values, but you could see them as your descendants. And I think many humans and even most humans will be willing to see uh, emulations as their descendants enough that they will, uh, the, certainly the emulations will see themselves as having been the descendants of humans. It's, it's us in a different form, but it's still us going on. So, so quick point. So, you know, as you, as, as, as you may or may not know, Robin Hanson may be my favorite person in the world. I just love Robin so much. Robin completes me. Uh-oh. And <laughs> <laughs> There's a butt coming. Yes. <laughs> Which is why it's, so, and I've had so many great times with Robin, which is why it is so hard for me to imagine what he says he actually thinks. Because it does appear that in this 30% scenario where, uh, of the Terminator, where the, where the robots come and exterminate all the biological humans within one year of taking over, Robin actually does claim that he'll be there saying, well, I think of those people killing us as our descendants, so I don't mind very much. This is actually not that big of a deal. Yes, so all of mankind will be dead, but there'll be these robots who will carry on many of the things we value, and there may even be some simulations of me in there, so no biggie. <laughs> And it's I, the ultimate biggie for mankind to be wiped out. I, I don't know how Brian could possibly be confused, but let me be clear. Extermination doesn't sound like a good thing to mine. I'm not promoting it. Yes. I'm not recommending extermination. I'm not saying let's promote extermination. I, you, you are not. What you're saying is that oh, you, this is what you have said in writing. You would consider it a much better world where the M's come and humanity perishes than if the M's never come and humanity continues as it is. That you have said. I think a future where there is, say, a thousand times as many descendants after some sort of big disaster could still be a future better than having not had that disaster. A big disaster That's where they kill all of us. Not all of us, some of us. Yes. <laughs> I don't yes. recommend extermination. I'm just saying I'm it's not, not the only thing are. to worry about. I'm, 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 say, I'm saying it seems very odd that you are so unperturbed by the scenario I'm of not. mass extinction of mankind. Just saying, I'm well, but yeah, but there'll be some robots it. that survive, so big deal. No, let's not exterminate. Please, if anybody ever yes. asks my opinion, I'll say yes. let's not do it. Yes, but you would not press the kill switch to destroy the M's before they kill us, and that's what everyone should do. Are you, are you, are you, are you, I'm sorry, Robin. Are you saying extermin you don't recommend extermination, but you're saying extermination could happen? 30%. You don't yeah. rule it out. A thousand years ago, if you had told somebody an industrial revolution is coming and they had said, well, gee, but will all those industrialists kill us farmers? Can you assure us of that? You would have had to say, no, I can't assure you of that. A huge disruptive change, there can be wars and all sorts of things could go wrong. Will I recommend it? No. Can I assure you it will happen? No. Okay, and if you said 30%, they would say, oh my God, that's scary. Yes, be scared. Oh, uh, There's a lot of things to be scared about in the future. I'm not telling you not to be scared. Well, okay, questions. Sorry. Uh, so in biology, the organism that wins out is the one that replicates more than others. That's how genes work. Those are the ones that survive. So in robot world, uh, is there any reason for the robots to keep us around if there's more robots that replicate and replace us? So let me just mention the argument that Brian alluded to before. Around the world today, there are millions and millions of retirees. Notice we don't go say, you know, let's kill them and take their stuff. They're not like adding that much to the economy. What are they doing for us? We outnumber them, we've got more power, we're faster. You know, let's just kill all the retirees. You could say that, but we don't. Why? There's not that many of them. And you would threaten the stability of institutions we share with them by even trying to do this. If there's enough emulations and humans are a small part of the world economy, then we could just go on as retirees. I'm not saying that will happen or to assure you of, I'm just saying it's a plausible scenario. Yes, uh, you know, just worth pointing out that you know, the not killing of the elderly has a lot to do with our sympathy for them. We identify with them. Uh, now, one thing that I don't see very much in Robin is, really, is thinking that much about what causes us to identify with people. Think about this. We identify a lot more with people who die on television than who die on newspapers. If, someone, if you film some of the death of a human being, we care a lot more than if you just read about it. Right? This, I think this says a lot about the human mind, that we identify with visible things that look biologically human much more than with any other creatures. Uh, so I, you know, I don't, I, Robin, Robin, personally, I think, could totally identify with the robot, but 
the idea that normal human beings would, I think, is wrong. Normal human beings will see them as like a podium and will not feel for them. And, of course, they might reciprocate. People um, like so. Brian were obsessed with the fact that they really are robots. No matter what they look like, you'll never be able to convince them. Mm -hmm. But for most people, the brain emulations I'm talking about can look just like all of you around the room if they want to, and they will just be much more articulate than the typical human. The typical emulation will be quite elite, copies of the few hundred most productive humans. So they will be as articulate and persuasive and even emotionally uh, communicative as the typical Nobel Prize winner, head of state, billionaire, uh, you know, Oscar winner. They are really be quite impressive. They will argue their point very persuasively, and I think most people will, in fact, be convinced. Yeah, you said that they'll look human in virtual reality. You may also notice that people don't mind killing things that look human in virtual reality. Because when you're playing a video game, you know it's not really human. No matter how human it looks, it's not human, so it's okay to kill it. Okay to kill millions of them in a game, actually, if you ever nuke something in civilization. Question. Yes. Hi, I'm curious if you were to um, think back to the 80s when you were studying artificial intelligence. What do you know today? What knowledge do you have today that you wish that you had then? And then what would you think about, what, what knowledge would you, if you were 16 or 18 today, what knowledge would you wish to acquire? History. As a 20-year-old, I didn't know much history. If I had known that every few decades we'd seen bursts of enthusiasm about this, major editorials in newspapers, major concern, going over and over again, over centuries, honestly, I would have been less likely to think that that time was different because it didn't really look that different from the previous times, and it wasn't, and this time probably isn't different either. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, the average IQ in the United States is 98, 99. Uh, we have a little bit north of uh, two children per household. Uh, if you take a look at countries uh, in Western Europe, it's pretty similar. If you go to East Asia, uh, the IQs tend to run uh, a couple of points higher, like 106. Uh, and a lot of times, by law, they have less children. Uh, if you take a look at some parts of the third world where the IQs are drastically low, uh, even lower than 60, uh, they have a lot of children. Um, aren't we racing towards a conflict? Uh, how do we, uh, you know, do you use these robots to get rid of these extra humans? Where, where do you go with this? <laughs> you just have a lot more to worry about. I'm honestly... <laughs> <laughs> hum some kinds of humans slowly displacing others because they have a higher birth rate is something that takes many decades and centuries to play out. As soon as robots start doubling every month, <laughs> uh, that just, you know, happens so much faster and that's where all the action is. Uh, this will have to be our final question. Uh, and all the, the other questions, uh, please chat with the speakers afterwards. Final question. Oh, by the way, in case I'm ever, okay, in the unlikely scenario I ever run for office, you should not kill low IQ people. Thank you. All right. <laughs> right. When I hear I Mr. Hansen talking about the robots and or emulations somehow acquiring their own capital, I'm inspired to cast my mind back about 160 years when I see that some owners are getting income from hiring out the skilled labor of their slaves, and as an incentive, letting the slaves have, keep some private savings from it, so in some cases, they can ev even eventually offer enough money to persuade the owner to free them. Now, would your great-great-grandfather have warned them, if you go on doing this, these entrepreneurial slaves and freedmen will dominate you? because that didn't happen, and the black population still does not dominate the South in any sense I can recognize. Um, so your question is? <laughs> if letting your captive labor acquire capital leads to domination, why didn't it happen when the um, captive labor was human? Okay. So, so again, Within different classes of humans, none have had a growth rate advantage of improving faster than others. So we haven't seen an enormous displacement of some by others. Humans together have been growing at a relatively uh, similar rate. Uh, but machines have been improving much faster than humans for a long time. That's the thing to be concerned about. It's not about them being slaves or, any, or anything like that. It's about uh, their abilities just improving so much faster. Thanks for your question. Uh, unfortunately, I have to uh, close questions. Uh, start thinking about how you're going to vote on the resolution as you listen to the summations of the two speakers. Robin, you have five minutes to uh, speak for the affirmative in conclusion. Five, five or two? Just, what? I, I was giving five. Oh, yeah. All right. 
Again, uh, the basic situation is that for many centuries, we've slowly been improving machines faster than we've been improving humans. Human wages have been going up consistently because a limited number of humans have become more and more valuable as we have more and better machines who can do all the other tasks, and so the tasks that humans do get more and more valuable to be done well. Uh, that can continue for a long time as long as there are a major category of tasks that humans just do better than the machines. Now, if according to Brian's animal analogy, there were just some things that humans would always be better at, so on a lot of them, then of course, we could just continue in this mode for a long time. The machines get better at what they do and humans get more and more valuable at what they do. But if there's nothing really special about humans <laughs> compared to machines, if as it seems to people who have designed machines and, and written algorithms and software, that all the things that humans do can be done also by complicated machines and software, then it would seem like eventually, if we improve those things faster than we improve humans, then eventually they'll just get better at all the tasks, and then we will lose our ability to earn wages. Now, if those things over there are all thoughtless uh, machines that have no interest in owning things or no interest in uh, doing, controlling things, et cetera. They just do exactly what they're told and they never talk back, et cetera. Well, then maybe humans would just own all these machines and we'd be rich, but we wouldn't be doing much, but we'd still be calling all the shots because those machines uh, don't care. But honestly, uh, when you start to have machines doing all the various important cognitive tasks that are done in our economy, you will need machines who do talk back, who think for themselves, who reconsider lots of options, who ask questions about what management has told them, <laughs> who invent new businesses and new scenarios for doing things, and you will need all of those abilities that human minds have had. So perhaps we'll invent other machines that do all those sorts of things, but one scenario, as I describe in my book, The Age of M, uh, that uh, I think is quite plausible, is that we will eventually find a way to take particular human brains and make detailed copies of them, which have all the same structure and all the same habits, et cetera. And if we can make them in machines cheaper than human brains, that is, they t you can make them in factories, you can make them fast, you can make them better and innovate them faster than you can do for human brains, then those things are a more direct substitute for humans. And those things definitely have all the human tastes for arguing and getting mad and asserting themselves than humans do. And if you are a capitalist trying to hire those things, you will pick the ones that are the most productive. And as I've said, when you're seeking productive workers today, if any of you ever do that, you know that docility and just doing what you're told and never talking back is not the major criteria you use in picking employees. You're looking for people who are uh, often think for themselves and will tell you when you're wrong and are ambitious and maybe even want your job. Those are often the most productive workers. They're the people you want to hire and when uh, the capitalists are looking for uh, these brain emulations for the ones that are the most productive for them, they will also be picking the sort of people that are paid the most today. Uh, those are the most productive people. And so those emulations uh, would be uh, ha assertive. Then many humans would want to become emulations. I, I, I know that some people will just have an assistance. No, I'm sure that those emulations are empty and they have no consciousness and no feelings and only flesh and blood like you and I have feelings. Some people will think like that. A lot of people really don't have any opinions on that when they see these emulations over there talking like them and acting like them and being persuasive and sort of winning in the world. <laughs> they'll want to be like them and they'll like stepping into the transporter if they needed to get somewhere. They would become an emulation because they want to be part of this successful society. And those people will want to bring their capital over and to have some autonomy and independence. And so this emulation world, for several different reasons, will be filled with robots who uh, have their own opinions and their own capital and their own doing things. And because they would combine the owner-manager role, uh, they would make more money than distant owners like humans sitting outside would who don't really understand what's going on. And that means slowly over time, this emulation economy would grow in its uh, wealth relative to the human economy in the sense of things they own, and then slowly humans would become on the margin. Just like today, subsistence farming is still on the margin because the industrial economy has grown and come to dominate the world. There are still subsistence farmers out there. Some of them may in the past have said, ooh, poor, poor us because we haven't... <laughs> We're losing, but most people decided to join the industrial economy. They said, let's move to the cities, let's work in factories, let's do all the things they need there and be successful because we want to win and be part of the new world. And I predict that's what will happen with robots. That is, we won't see them as strange, alien others. Uh, people will 
become them, and that's where the future will be. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Brian, five minutes to uh, negate. All right, well, since we're voting, I want to remind you what, the, what we are voting on. So remember the original resolution. Robots will eventually dominate the world and eliminate human ability to, abilities to earn wages. Uh, so I focus a lot on this domination question because Robin, in his opening statement, used a definition of domination so weak that it seems that tractors already dominate agriculture, buildings already dominate cities, in which case it's not very interesting. But I think that in the process of arguing, I got him to actually move to the normal definition of domination where robots actually call the shots and run things and have a 30% chance of killing all of us. All right, so now of course, if they are gonna kill all of us, then Robin should still win the debate, right? Because then, he, uh, then you voted on the basis of the normal meaning of the word domination, and if, that, and if that's correct, then again, we should be very afraid, but doesn't mean that it's not coming. Uh, but I don't think Robin actually gave us any really good reason to think that such domination will occur. Uh, Robin is, uh, is, again, strangely resistant to the idea that when we go and create robots, we will tr uh, we will, humans will deliberately create them in order to serve man. Again, uh, you, can, you can talk about correlations between docility and worker productivity all you want, but the fact remains when you create something to serve your own purposes, you create it to do, to do that very thing. When we, uh, when we domesticated animals, we did deliberately make them as docile as possible. Right now, we don't worry about making machines docile because they're docile by definition. Why is it that we don't always hire the most docile applicant? Because we have to choose between five people, some of whom may have good docility but, be bad, but, 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 not, but not be very smart. Others might be very smart but not very docile. In the very scenario that Robin talks about, we would be able to choose between all existing humans, so it seems still very likely that we would get someone who combines all virtues who combines being, uh, being really smart and being really hardworking and being original and offering constructive, cr uh, constructive feedback without giving any kind of back talk or bargaining for wages or causing trouble. You know, like, just, just think about uh, your dream worker, the dream worker, someone who's got all the good stuff and none of the bad stuff because yes, just complaining and asking for money is actually something that employers generally do not want. So in any case, so Robin, uh, Robin equivocates on domination. Uh, uh, this is important just to understand what the proposition is. I think Robin does actually ultimately believe that robots will dominate in the normal Terminator Matrix type sense, which I think you voted on. So in that case, don't, re don't change your vote just because uh, he is using the word domination in a different way because I think ultimately he does believe that he does use it in the same way that you do. Uh, I think a lot of people had tr trouble with this idea of robots owning, owning assets, and you should have trouble with the idea of robots owning assets. Again, why would we pay them if we don't have to? Again, Robin does have a very specific scenario where the robots are actually just a copy of a human, so if the human wanted money, the robot will want money. Even he will say this is only one scenario out of many, so there's no really strong reason to think that that, uh, that, that scenario is true. And even I think Robin's second favorite scenario is that the kind of robots we get are the kind that we're getting right now, where we just keep improving software in a lot of different marginal ways. Ways. But again, if, that's, if that is the kind of robot that we get, then there's also no reason to believe the second part of the proposition, which is that it will eliminate human ability to earn wage, human abilities to earn wages, because robots can improve in a lot of ways, but as long as the improvement is uneven, then by basic economics, the law of comparative advantage, all the humans need to do to keep earning wages is to specialize in the things that robots are comparatively bad at, and then consume all the bounty that the extra robot productivity is giving us. Um, now, and, uh, let's see, and last point, so uh, now, now, you know, I do want to close with a compliment to Robin. So Robin has repeatedly said something that seems totally sensible to me, which is that why do we have thousands of people study the past and only five people study the future, <laughs> roughly, and Robin's one of them. That's a great point. We do need a lot more people to study the future. And what Robin is doing is amazing because he is, one, he is a pioneer. Uh, but you should not expect a pioneer to get it right. And I'm afraid that, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> And, and again, much as I love Robin, I think that he has gotten so many things wrong that you should vote now. Thank you. Okay, um, so please vote. Thank you, Brian. Thank you to the debaters. Uh, please uh, vote on the resolution. Again, uh, a debate is an intellectual sprint. It's not a marathon, uh, but I think it does shed light, and I thank uh, both of our debaters for shedding a good deal of light uh, and a good deal of humor in the bargain on this topic. As you're voting, uh, vote uh, for uh, undecided or against the resolution. Uh, and uh, Naomi, I guess you're there uh, to close the vote in a couple of minutes and uh, then report on the instantaneous result uh, in this sprint. Uh, 
for the marathon, of course, you're going to want to buy Robin's book uh, on sale for just uh, 20 smackers. Yes, do, so, buy, um, do buy it. Yeah. You definitely should buy it. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, and uh, we all recommend it. Uh, and uh, so we're voting. And uh, Naomi, you tell me, when do you want to close the vote? And do you want to come in? Uh, 30, more 30 more seconds to close the vote. Um, for, against, or undecided on the resolution for this intellectual sprint. Yes. Can you stay undecided at the end? Oh, yes. Uh, can you stay undecided at the end? Of course. Uh, we, we always find, I've never found a situation in which the vote doesn't change, but of course, individuals could stay undecided, it could stay no, you could stay where you were, of course. Uh, if you've been influenced by nobody, you just feel the same way as you did before. But uh, we always find that there has been a change uh, in the vote, uh, and uh, we'll see if it uh, is true this time. Um, okay, Naomi? Uh, there's still votes coming in. Uh, there's still votes coming in? What was the initial count? Well, uh, you'll get... Uh, by the way, Naomi will simply uh, announce uh, the winner, and uh, we will post all of the numbers on our website so that you can examine them, the initial and the, and the final. By the way, uh, the, uh, the program is uh, devised to only reflect uh, those people who vote both, for, both before and after. Anybody who, who votes after and didn't vote before, the vote doesn't, won't, will, not, will be rejected. Uh, so it is a perfect before and after vote of people who actually did both vote both times. Uh, Naomi will give the winner, but uh, we'll give you the numbers afterwards. Are you gonna close the vote? So it's actually completely a draw. So the, the numbers are hard to follow, but we judge the winner by who picked up the most votes. So judging what you voted for before, now after. So the yes vote uh, got 4.55%. The no vote increased by 4.55%. <laughs> and undecided decreased by 9.09%. <laughs> so they are both winners. No, what happened? What, what happened remarkably is that they both picked up almost they both picked up votes uh, from the undecideds, but they picked up just exactly the same a number almost to the decimal point. So therefore, this is the first draw that I've ever seen. Therefore, nobody gets the prize money. Too bad. Uh, we split it in half. <laughs> no, okay. Thank you.